Well, my topic uh, today is, uh, is about political entrepreneurship and wealth destruction. And, and one of the things a lot of you have probably heard already in, uh, in one of the classes, or maybe one or more of the classes, is the old, sort of the old libertarian idea that there are two ways to make money. And uh, one way to make money is to produce goods and services for other people uh, in, in the free market. And the other way to make money is to uh, use the powers of the state in order to transfer money from somebody else or some other person or group and give them nothing in return. So, uh, for example, if I'm in the mousetrap business and I make a better mousetrap or a cheaper mousetrap and I make more money that way, well, that's, that's yeah, it's type number one. Uh, on the other hand, if I go to the legislature and get them to pass a law banning the importation of all foreign mousetraps, and I can sell, sell my mousetraps for double of what I was selling them for, then I can make more money that way too. But all the consumer gets in return is they have to pay more. They get the same stupid mousetrap, but they just have, there's more money that leaves their pockets. So that's another way of making money. And so in, in the modern language of economics, that means there's a distinction between profit seeking and rent seeking. And uh, I never liked this word rent, even though it was rent seeking, even though it was invented by one, my old graduate school professor, Gordon Tullock. And uh, I, I prefer plunder seeking to, uh, instead of rent seeking. But uh, in the, you know, economic rent is uh, the technical definition of it is a payment of a resource in excess of what it would take to put that resource on the market. So if I could make a dollar a mousetrap in my mousetrap business, that would be uh, just a free market price. But if I did get the legislature to block competition in the mousetrap business and I can sell them for $2, that extra dollar would be a, what's, what economists call a rent. You know, I, I prefer something like uh, the profits of plunder or something like that. But that's what the language is. They use rent seeking versus profit seeking. So an entrepreneur, a private entrepreneur, is somebody who engages in in profit seeking, not rent seeking. It makes his money by being alert to what the consumers want and gives them what they want and makes money that way. And that's how value is created in the economy. That's what creates value for everybody because all exchange is mutually advantageous. When you engage in buying and selling, both parties benefit. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, trade. And that's what creates value in the economy. Whereas political entrepreneurship is totally different. Political entrepreneurship is, has to do with uh, influencing the government, for one thing. Another, uh, in the way I just mentioned, another aspect of it is uh, with private entrepreneurship, um, uh, you, you don't, uh, let's see, I'm going to put this, I don't want to confuse you about this. Um, with private entrepreneurship, the, the consumer is really in charge. I, on my opening speech on Sunday night, I, I read this big long quote from von Mises saying that some people are, get confused because they think corporate executives and bankers and people of that sort really run the economy, but it's really the consumer. Because no, no matter how powerful Bill Gates might be, for example, the richest man in the world, he has no power at all to force me to buy anything. You know, I could tell Bill Gates, go play in the traffic, Bill Gates. I'm using an Apple computer, you know, even though he's the richest man in the world. I can't say that to Barack Obama. I can't say, I'm not paying taxes to Barack Obama. Go play in the traffic. You know, <laughs> he'll send men with guns after me to put me in a government cage for seven years. Bill Gates has no power to do anything like that. He has to persuade consumers to buy his products. And he's, he's apparently done a pretty good job of it because he's become the richest man in the world. In the, but with political entrepreneurs, they spend their time trying to isolate themselves from the pressures of anybody, consumers, investors, voters, uh, to be pretty much on their own, uh, to plunder at will, to do, do what they want. That's what a political entrepreneur does. And I thought uh, to demonstrate this, I thought I'd tell a short story about uh, uh, a real private entrepreneur, a profit-seeking entrepreneur versus a, a uh, political entrepreneur that I've written about in, uh, in some of my writings. And the example would be, in the first case, James J. Hill. Some of you may be familiar, I don't know if some of you may be familiar with uh, James 
Jay Hill, who he is. He is the, uh, he was the founder in the 19th century of the Great Northern Railroad. It was the only privately funded transcontinental railroad. It went from Minnesota to California, okay? And it disproved the idea that government money was necessary to build a transcontinental railroad. You know, for, for many, many years, there was all this talk about the free rider problem, that private investors could, would never put up enough money to build such a big thing, a transcontinental railroad. And the government did build build two transcontinental railroads around the same time, the, the 1870s, 1880s, the Union Pacific and the, and the Central Pacific. But James J. Hill built, with private funding, private investors, the, uh, the uh, Great Northern Railroad was the name of his, his railroad. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to read to you a couple of quotes from uh, a, a, a historian friend of mine named Burton Folsom. And I highly recommend uh, Burton Folsom's book on the history of American entrepreneurs. Uh, it was originally called The Myth of the Robber Barons. Uh, and so, let's see, page 115... Here's an example of a real profit-seeking entrepreneur, James J. Hill. And, and if you like biographies, it's his, his autobiography is called Highways of Progress. Very interesting book. He, he talks about this man who he had one eye. His father died at age when he was 10 years old. And he had to support his mother and his six siblings. And he was uh, a combination of extremely hard worker and high intelligence. And he, and, and he also saved every penny he, that he could. And he ended up became, becoming a very wealthy man, the operator of the most successful transcontinental railroad in America at the time, Great Northern. And here's how this historian, Burton Folsom, describes the way he operated as a business person. He said, uh, Hill's quest for short routes, low grades, and few curvatures was an obsession. In 1889, Hill conquered the Rocky Mountains by finding the legendary Marias Pass. Lewis and Clark had described a low pass through the Rockies back in 1805. But later, no one seemed to know whether it really existed or if it did, where it was. Hill wanted the best gradient, so much of what he hired, so much that he hired a man to spend months searching western Montana for his legendary pass. He did, in fact, find it, and the ecstatic hills shortened his route by almost 100 miles. So this is the kind of person that left no stone unturned in terms of trying to find out how to improve the quality of his railroad line and to make it cheaper. Uh, and and then, then if you can compare that to the government-subsidized railroad line, so Hill was a businessman, and every time he cut a dollar off his cost, that was a dollar in his pocket and, and his business partner's pockets as a profit. So he was highly motivated to minimize the cost and the price to his customers of this, of this transcontinental railroad. By contrast, we had the government-subsidized railroad. And this is political entrepreneurship. And the subsidies were per-mile subsidies. So, and they're mostly land grant subsidies and cheap loans, you know, far below in the market rate of interest loans by the government to these, uh, quote, corporations that were created by the government. And the man in charge of it was named Grenville Dodge. He was, he was an old friend of Abraham Lincoln's. Actually, Lincoln made him a general during the Civil War, and he spent the Civil War killing Indians and uh, mostly to get the Indians out of the way where they intended to build railroad tracks after the war. That was pretty much Grenville Dodge's uh, wartime service, as they call it. And so here's how Burton Folsom describes Dodge and his methods of business, as opposed to James J. Hill. He said, since Dodge was in a hurry, he laid track on the ice and snow. Imagine that, building railroad tracks on top of frozen ice. We're talking about the Rocky Mountains, after all, through the, through the Rocky Mountains. Naturally, the line had to be rebuilt in the spring when the ice melted. But that, was more, that meant more money to Grenville Dodge because the more t railroad track they laid, the more money they made to the government. It was, the gov it was taxpayers' uh, dollars. So what was worse, unanticipated spring flooding along the lower fork of the Platte River washed out rails, bridges, and telephone poles doing at least $50,000 damage in the first year. No wonder some observers estimated the actual building cost at almost three times what it should have been. And so you see the big difference between just the business operation of an entrepreneur versus a, uh, 
a political entrepreneur. And, and, and from what I read, you know, I've read, read these uh, stories about the building of the transcontinental railroads. James J. Hill's line from Minnesota to California looks something like that. This is my map of the United States that I draw. Whereas, whereas the, the, uh, the, the line of the Union Pacific looked very different. It looked more like this. And, and so, but I have more. I have, I have pictures of the actual railroad lines uh, that, that I got from the internet this morning. The one on top is the Great Northern from Minnesota to California. That's the rail line. And the one on the bottom is the Union Pacific. And you might notice that uh, that version of the Union Pacific looks a lot like my artwork. So over here, there's, there's my artwork. And there's the actual Union Pacific rail line. And so, you know, why the difference? Well, you would think you're, you want to transport the, uh, the produce, all the farm goods, the agricultural goods from the Midwest to the West Coast and ship them to China or wherever. You would, tr you th you would think a, a business person would try to find the most direct route. And here, here where my finger is, that's the famous Marias Pass that Lewis and Clark discovered in 1805. And no one, no one knew where it was until the 1870s when James J. Hill went out there and hired a, an engineer to find it. And they found it knocked off 100 miles off of his route. But then you see this, you know, this crazy, you know, lines built by the, the government right there. Well, the reason for that is that with these political entrepreneurs, in order to get votes in Congress for the subsidies, you had to promise every member of Congress that we'll, we'll run a railroad line down to your dinky little town. So your dinky little town with 50 people if you know your hometown, if you want to vote in Congress for the continuing subsidies, there's going to be a railroad line down there. Okay, uh, and so and why wouldn't they build it? It was just it was somebody else's money. James J. Hill was building with his money. It was his debt, and he he could personally go bankrupt if the railroad went bankrupt. But when the politicians are spending the money, it's not their money, and so so every little burg in in the whole western part of the United States. Uh, uh, that has one of these railroad lines that was grossly unprofitable uh, was built if they wanted to vote. Okay, and so that's that's one example of uh, the difference between uh, real entrepreneurship and political entrepreneurship in terms of efficiency uh, of building things and, and the cost effectiveness. So at one point, the uh, the Union Pacific and the Central and the North Central Pacific they were bankrupted, and James J. Hill was the only was sort of a monopoly because he uh, he was successful and they weren't. And even though they had all these these subsidies. Okay, so now <clears throat> what I want to do next is, is tell you uh, some of the techniques that uh, I've run across in my reading and research that, that uh, political entrepreneurs do to uh, isolate themselves from consumer pressure. And, and I'll, but also keep in mind the, the economic lesson here in, in distinguishing between profit seeking and plunder seeking is that profit seeking involves creating products, creating services, serving customers. Okay. Rent seeking or plunder seeking involves transferring money from one pocket to the other, robbing Peter to pay Paul under the auspices of government. The government is, is the one doing the robbing of Peter giving some of the money to Paul and keeping some for itself, okay? And that is economically destructive. It destroys wealth because the opportunity cost of getting involved in politics is all the productivity foregone. If a corporation is spending time in Washington lobbying for some regulation or law that will screw its competition, by definition, it is not back home working on producing better products, or better, better services. Uh, that's what got Bill Gates in trouble with the government. Bill Gates thought he could run Microsoft from Redmond, Washington, without without even having a Washington lobbying office. He did not even have a Washington. Microsoft did not even have a Washington D.C. lobbying office, and the Washington establishment was so outraged by that that they they investigated him for ten years, and then dragged him into court and sued him. And that lasted another four or five years, and then pretty much nothing came of it. But they, they diverted his management uh, team for 15 years, basically, you know, to some extent, away from running Microsoft toward 
dealing with government. And of course, he now has a lobbying office and spend, sends many millions of dollars to Washington. It's not much more different than the, the mafia, is it? If you want to do business in this country, you got to give us our take. you got to finance our careers. Okay. And so the opportunity cost of all that political activity is productive activity foregone. If a young student like yourself decides to go to law school because you hear that lobbyists are mostly lawyers and they make a lot of money, well, good luck to you. But as an economist, I think of that as, well, that same student could have gone to engineering school and become an engineer and, and help figure out how to produce goods and services cheaper or a better quality or become an entrepreneur himself or herself and, and a creator of wealth rather than a destroyer of wealth. So the more and more people who become involved in the whole political process, the less wealthy we all are. Uh, the late economist Mansur Olson wrote many several books about this. Oops, here's my, my blue pen. <clears throat> I'll write this name down for you. Mansur Olson, he, he passed away a few years ago. <clears throat> he wrote several books about this. He, he used to give an example of the effects of plunder-seeking or rent-seeking. The example he would give was, imagine this. Do you know what a, a sumo wrestler is? Sumo wrestler. So these these big fat Japanese guys in diapers, and they get they get uh, they they draw a circle, and they they like slam into each other and they wrestle and whoever gets thrown out of the circle loses I guess, and so anyway, Mansur also also used to explain the effects of uh, political entrepreneurship by saying, imagine two sumo wrestlers wrestling over the contents. The, the award to the winner is the contents of a small china shop. So it's one of these shops with lots of lots of uh, shelves with fine china and goblets and glasses. And these two big guys are just knocking everything over, smashing everything. And they're all done. And the winner walks off with one goblet. And, uh, and so the, and the china shop represents the economy. And so he, he's, he, the example he's trying to make is that if, if we go too far with the politicization of society, this is what happens. We destroy a lot more than what the winners get. The winners of the whole plunder-seeking game, they get, they become wealthy, they do well, but the rest of us are left with broken glass. And that's that was Mansur Olson, okay? Another trick that is used by the political entrepreneurs is a trick that has uh, created a, a monopoly in politics. In the United States, and this is true of other countries too, Other, demo I think it's true of all democracies now, that uh, once you're elected to the United States Congress, it's almost impossible to lose your seat no matter what happens. And so, you know, the, the classical theory of democracy uh, that everybody is taught in school is, is some version of, you know, looking at government as perfectly competitive. You know, you know the voters vote in, the, the politicians, and the politicians faithfully carry out their, their, their demands or their, their, you know, what they want you to do. Uh, not true. The politicians have isolated themselves from us. They've gerrymandered themselves in. And uh, so this word gerrymandering, is actually a combination of two words. Uh, there was a politician in the 19th century named Elbridge Jerry, J-E-R-Y, and Salamander. A salamander is a lizard. Here's, um, here's my art, here's a picture. This is my version of a salamander. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, it's kind of a squiggly animal in Eldridge Jerry. Eld, Eldridge Jerry. Okay. And of course, what gerrymandering is, is, you know, each state, uh, each state has congressional districts. And let's, let's pick one of the easy states like Nebraska. <laughs> or, or it could be Kansas, or it could be North Dakota or South Dakota. I think, you know, I guess they got tired of drawing maps when they got out west and they just, let's just make them all look like rectangles. So let's say there were four congressional districts in, uh, this is Kansas. You could draw, you could draw the four congressional districts like that. And you know, there are, there are members of Congress or, or how many members of Congress each state has is determined by the population. So let's say there's enough population to have four four congressional districts. So you have four members of Congress from Kansas. Or you could draw Kansas like this. Here's the state of Kansas again. You could have one district 
like this. Here's District 1. Here's District 2. Here's 3. And the rest is 4. Okay, you could do that. Now, why would you do something like that? Well, why you would do something like that is that the way this works is that every 10 years there's a census. And whoever happens to control the governor's office gets to rewrite the districts based on the census. They create the districts. And so let's say that the Republicans are in the governor's mansion at the time. And in District 1 right here is 80% Republican. Okay, that means whoever runs for Congress in that district as a Republican will always be reelected. It's 80% Republicans. Okay, and the same with number three. The district number three is, say, 75% Republican. So no matter what, whoever runs, they're going to get elected and reelected and reelected and reelected. And then when the Democrats get in, they do the same thing. If they happen to be in, in a census year, they'll redraw the districts so that they look so, you know, to their favor. And so as a result of this, this is the main reason. There are other reasons for this. But as a result, this is uh, information on re-election rates over the years in the, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The top is the U.S. House of Representatives from 1964 to 2014. And as you can see, the re-election rate uh, is up there about 95%. So that's what I meant when I said, no matter what you do, you're going to get reelected in the U.S. Congress. And uh, I can remember many years ago, I forget exactly when this was, uh, when uh, Congressman Barney Frank from Massachusetts was in the, in the Congress. Uh, he's, I think he's retired now. But it was in the front page of the Washington Post for a whole week that his, uh, his uh, partner was running a, a male prostitution ring out of the basement of his townhouse. They kept saying it was the basement, but I always wondered how how they could have, you know, dozens of prostitute, prostitutes coming in and out, and Barney knew nothing about it. But it was a whole week, every the headline, front page in the Washington Post. And then, of course, Barney was uh, reelected maybe 10 or 12 times after that. So you can even run a whorehouse out of your house in Congress and be elected 10 times, as long as you're good at bringing the money back, taxpayers' dollars back to Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I'll never forget a, a congressman there named uh, Congressman Flood. And uh, I don't know, you, I don't know if you people are, uh, you people are probably not, I don't know how many people have ever seen the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons? <laughs> Some of the old timers in the room, in the room, but or or, or or the insomniacs who watch late night TV and watch old cartoons or on the web or something. But anyway, this is a cartoon and. There was a bad guy in the cartoon. His name was Snidely Whiplash. And Snidely wore a black cape and a big black hat, and he had a big handlebar mustache. You know, and, uh, and there would be scenes in the cartoons like uh, uh, a poor widow would be saying, oh, please don't foreclose on the mortgage. It's 20 below zero outside. And Snidely with Whiplash would say, so wear a sweater. You know, he was a really bad guy, you know, bad guy like that. Anyway, Congressman Flood looked just like Snidely Whiplash. He wore a black cape. He was in Congress. He wore a black cape, big black hat, and a, and a, a waxed handlebar mustache. And I will, that's why I never forget this guy. And he was, uh, he was convicted uh, of, a, of a felony. And uh, Pennsylvania state law at the time, said he, and he appealed it, said that he could still run for re-election if it was under appeal. So he did, and he got re-elected. And... and uh, <laughs> even though he was found guilty of a felony. And, uh, and I remember reading newspaper uh, articles saying, uh, asking people, did you vote for Congressman Flood? Sure. Why did you vote for him? He's a, he's a, crook. He's a crook. And the, the typical answer was, well, they're all crooks in Washington, but our crook is really good at getting money for us for a new post office building, a new school, something. So as so long as you bring the money back, you can do that. So that's, that's uh, basically what we see here with the U.S. House of Representatives, 95% average re-election rate for like 50 years, and it's not much different in the Senate. It's a little different, but uh, but it's it's also pretty high in the Senate. So they've, they've gerrymandered themselves in. And the final thing I have here, I have some, I have uh, an article from the National Journal of some of the worst gerrymandered districts in America. So the, these are actual congressional districts uh, geographically uh, you know, displayed on there. You see how they're drawn? And they're drawn 
not too differently. Where's where's my other map at? So you look at they're not they're drawn not too differently from you know, you know that's my map that I drew a little bit a little bit ago. And there's there's these ones. It's it's not uh, not that much of an exaggeration to see how they're drawn. But that's why they're drawn like that. So uh, I don't know. Maybe some of you live in some of these places uh, here. But so these are. This was an article in the 10 most contorted congressional districts. Okay. So that's another trick that political entrepreneurs use to isolate themselves from consumers. You see, a private entrepreneur does exactly the opposite. They're always doing everything they can to please the consumer because that's how you make your money. You know, whereas in politics, you make your money by, by giving the, the, the consumer, the voter, the investor one big middle finger. That's how you succeed in, in politics. Uh, another another uh, gimmick that is used to uh, get around uh, uh, to voter pressure in politics is uh, log rolling. Log rolling. If it rains enough, I think Dr. Block and Bob Murphy will have a log rolling contest out back when they're finished with the mud wrestling also. Here's an example of log rolling. Let's say you have a, a community with three, uh, three di distinct voter groups on the issues of school spending and hospital spending. Okay, so you have group A that wants more schools No more hospitals. Group B wants more hospitals. No more schools. Group C wants no more of anything. So I'll call that status quo. They don't, they don't want more schools. They don't want more hospitals. So you might have the, the older people in the community are willing to raise taxes to spend more on hospitals or, or a, wing, a new wing in the, hospital, the local county hospital. But their kids are grown up, they're out of school, so they don't want to spend more of their tax dollars on schools. Younger parents, they, they'll spend more taxes on schools. They still have kids in school. They're not too worried about health care yet. They're young. So that would be this, this group here, group A. Okay, so we're going to take a referendum on... Uh, uh, and we're going to use majority rule. We're going to use majority rule to vote uh, on uh, raising taxes a little bit, property taxes, to pay for an extra wing at the hospital. And so with majority rule, you need, you need two out of three. You need a majority out there. Let's say, you know, they have some communities that do have qualified majority. Let's say it's 66%, you know, it's qualified majority. So you need two out of three. Uh, would if these were the true preferences of the people in this community, could you get a majority in a referendum to spend more money on hospitals? Who wants to take a, a guess? If you, you get a free ticket to uh, karaoke tonight, if you guess right. The tickets are already free, aren't they? <clears throat> if, uh, could you get a majority vote in this community for a referendum that's uh, that would increase taxes to pay for more hospitals. <clears throat> no, you don't get one. You don't only get one third. You, this this group represents one third, and they want more hospitals, but the other two don't. So you wouldn't get that. How about more spending on schools? Yeah. The same thing. You only get one third, and you, but you need two thirds for that to go through. So the true preferences uh, of the community, according to the majority rule, is. Nothing, no spend, no more spending on anything. The status quo would be maintained. But of course, what log rolling is, is the people in Group B could go to Group A, if it's possible, and say, listen, we don't give a crap about schools, but we want a more a bigger hospital. So here's what we'll do. We will all vote for more school spending. If when the vote comes up in a couple of months for more hospital spending, you vote for more hospital spending. Okay, it's vote trading or log rolling. And that's what happens every single day, all day long in Congress, in state legislatures. That's what they do, vote trading. That's why you see the congressman from Brooklyn voting yes on the farm bill, even though there's no farmers in Brooklyn. 
That's why you see the, the congressman from Kansas voting yes on the latest urban redevelopment bill, even though there, there's, not, there's no city anywhere near his district in Kansas. You know, they've been trading votes. And so what that means is that because of log rolling, even though the, the actual preferences of the people is no more spending on anything, the result is more spending on everything. You, you spend more money on schools and hospitals, even though the true preferences of the people in this demo, supposed democracy is no more spending on anything. And, and so, so that's another gimmick or trick um, that, that is used. Another, another of the uh, tactics of the political entrepreneur is uh, illustrated in a book that I mentioned in my speech on Sunday. The book called Money for Nothing by Fred McChesney. And, uh, and Fred McChesney, uh, um, this book was published by Harvard University Press. So it's a, real, a very scholarly book. But, uh, but it has a kind of a simple message. And, the, and, and what the message is, is there's a, is a big segment of all the legislation that comes out of Washington and regulations that are proposed and implemented by Washington that is uh, very harmful uh, to, the, to the bottom line of businesses. Higher taxes on your business, regulations that would be very costly to enforce or to comply with, things would be very harmful to a business. For example, uh, uh, the Clinton administration proposed putting price controls on pharmaceuticals. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't, didn't like that because they, they couldn't legally sell their, their drugs for as high as uh, they're, they're currently selling them for. And, and that'd be one example. And so they were quite alarmed at that. And so, but anyway, what, what the Money for Nothing book is about is this, this type of regulation that is very onerous and, uh, and costly on businesses that uh, McChesney observed uh, that here's the way it works, is that these things are proposed and, and it's very alarming to businesses. So the businesses then organize a, a lobbying effort to stop it, to get this bill stopped or to get this regulation reversed something like that. And that requires them writing checks for many millions of dollars to the Republicans and Democrats in Washington, D.C., who control all this game. And then once that happens, once all that money comes in to pay for the careers of the Democrats and Republicans in Washington, the politicians say, well, this is a dumb idea. Whose idea was this? Let's get, let's get rid of this foolish law putting price controls on pharmaceuticals or, or whatever it is. So it's basically an extortion racket. And, and the, the staffers on Capitol Hill actually have their own, they call these bills, the legislation, legislative bills, they call them milker bills. They're milking campaign contributions uh, from business people. That's a, a euphemism for bribery, in other words. Or extortion would actually be a better word, extortion. You want to do business in this town, you got to give us our take, is what, is what they're saying. No different from the mafia, is it? And, uh, and so, uh, so they use a milk, milker bills. And there's a big long example of this in McChesney's book, and it's, it's hilarious because the member of Congress who or orchestrated this whole thing, uh, his last name was Leach, Congressman <laughs> Leach, <laughs> and, and I, know, I, just, I just couldn't get over that reading this whole long passage about this episode. And, and he does mention that the uh, pharmaceuticals was a, a, an actual example in his book of they proposed price controls on pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical industry sent $3 million to Washington, D.C. Then the Clintons said, ah, forget about it. We're not going to do this. And they, and they, they wish it. But they, they pocketed the $3 million. Okay, money for nothing. Okay. Uh, another tactic I'll, I'll, write about, I'll tell you about is... Uh, uh, a book that I wrote uh, a long time ago, co-authored, called Underground Government. <clears throat> and uh, what this book was about, I co-authored it with James Bennett. What this book was about was we did a study of, you know, in the late 1970s, the United States, there was a, a tax revolt. And there, a lot of states... It was at the state level, 
California was the most famous. They, they limited uh, property taxes. They, some of the states limited how much borrowing could happen. Even some counties in the, in the United States had uh, 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 laws passed that said such things as uh, uh, the taxes, you know, the, the tax, the property tax can never go up fast, faster than personal income goes mm. up. So if personal income goes up 2%, that's the limit on, on how, you, how much your taxes could ever go, your property taxes. Some states did the same, same kind of thing. So there was a, tax, a genuine tax revolt in this country, and it eventually led to the election of Ronald Reagan uh, in, in 1980. Um, they, they, that was a part of this anti-government mentality that did exist, you know, backlash against the overreaching government of the 70s. Okay? So my co-author, James Bennett, and I, we're thinking, well, how is government going to react to this? You know, the classical theory of democracy says uh, that's the cannon fire. Uh, Walter Block must have won the wrestling match. He always he does that every year whenever he wins the wrestling match. Uh, if he wins the, the, uh, the uh, chess match tonight, you'll hear the same thing. He does the same thing. He's, he's kind of goes overboard with this competition stuff. Okay. But, uh, but as I was saying, about you know, we're wondering is government going to do what the textbooks tell all the kids they're going to do that the people have demanded uh, limitations on government spending and borrowing and taxing therefore that's what you will get we did a historical study mostly and found that uh, for even at that time in the in, by the in the 1980s we're, we're talking about we had about a hundred year uh, history in the United States of how governments did respond to uh, tax revolts by telling the people okay, the people have spoken, we will pass this law limiting government. But then they would set up whole new institutions that would enable them to spend money off budget or off the books. And the, the most notorious example was uh, something uh, in Washington state that was known as whoops. They called it whoops, W-P-S, there's two P's in there actually, uh, two P's. This stood for Washington Public Power Supply System. The people out there voted over and over and over again. They, they tried to get a referendum to build nuclear power plants. And uh, the people did not want to spend their tax dollars on nuclear power plants in uh, Washington and Oregon. And, and so they set up what's called an off-budget enterprise. And they, they funded this through what are called revenue bonds. And these revenue bonds are a type of government bond where the government just is said, decided to say, well, these don't require voter approval. You know, with, other, with the other type of bond is called a general obligation bond. That means if the government borrows money and you buy this bond, the government will tell you the taxpayers in the state of Alabama or whoever is issuing the bond are responsible for making sure you get the principal and interest paid on your bond that you bought for us. So you're guaranteed to get your money back eventually from the government, that you lent the government by buying them a bond. But with a revenue bond, there is no such guarantee the, uh, the, and so why would you do that? Well, you get a higher rate of interest, but the, uh, and where's the money going to come from? Well, in this case, we're going to build nuclear power plants and we're going to sell electricity. And we're going to sell electricity, and that's, that's where the revenue will come from, from, from these things. Uh, but in the meantime, so you have a government, you know, government is notoriously inefficient at building anything to begin with. But you isolate them a further step away from any scrutiny by the voters, and they become really, really inefficient. And so the end result of all this was the biggest bankruptcy in the history of municipal finance in American history. Uh, they, they defaulted on two and a half billion dollars in government debt uh, out there in, in Washington state over this. And so in, in our book, we, we go, we have chapter after chapter of this uh, in New York state, people would turn down referendum to build state university, new state universities or housing developments three, four or five times. They would, they would uh, say, okay, people have spoken, we're not gonna do this. And then they turn around and they set up uh, an off budget enterprise and fund it with revenue bonds. And, uh, and, and, do, and where I live in Florida, they're doing, the, they're doing this now with the, they wanna build passenger train from Miami to Orlando and they wanna fund it with revenue bonds that are not voter approved. And so uh, the same type of thing is bound to happen. They, they have all this money and, and, and uh, they'll create a new whoops in, uh, in Florida if they, if they go through with that. And so, and so that's another tactic that is used to isolate themselves, politicians, from, from anybody who can pressure them. 
another book that uh, Bennett and I wrote that along the same lines is called Destroying Democracy. It's about the manufacturing of the will of the people. And, uh, and I got the idea for the title from uh, the Federalist Papers, uh, 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 number 10, Federalist number 10 by James Madison, where he wrote that uh, uh, the whole purpose of the Constitution, he said, was to control the violence of faction, by which he meant special interest politics, the violence of faction. And that's the whole purpose of the Constitution, he said. But what this book is about is uh, uh, Jim Bennett and I gathered uh, uh, reams of st statistics back then on government grants to hundreds of different special interest groups. There was a nonprofit organization in the D.C. suburbs that had done this. Uh, the, the, it was called the Conservative Caucus, and they had big filing cabinets for, of uh, Freedom of Information Act re uh, requests and data on where where the tax dollars are going when they when they give money to the Sierra Club or to the AFL CIO or you know name your special interest group, the Chamber of Commerce, whoever. And so we wrote this big fat book about this. And and the way the system works is the government gives tax dollars away to uh, lobbying groups, political pressure groups. They use the money to lobby for bigger government and higher taxes. It works. They get the additional money and they give some of it back to the same lobbying groups who lobby more for more government, bigger government. So these are all groups uh, that use tax dollars to manufacture the, the supposed will of the people, okay, that, that, we, that government supposedly obeys in a democracy. And so, and that's why I call, we call that destroying democracy because the government is literally financing the violence of faction that Madison warned against. You know, the Constitution is supposed to limit the violence of faction, but in reality, the government actually feeds it and, 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 uh, and uh, gives it money. So in the third book I wrote with Bennett on this same topic, it's called Official Lies, How Washington Misleads Us. And, and again, that's the theme of that is manufacturing the will of the people and not, not obeying the will of the people, but manufacturing the will of the people. And, uh, and I, I don't have time to get into a, a lot of it. The, the final thing I'll mention is uh, fiscal illusion. This is a term from public choice economics. And, and the main vehicle of fiscal illusion is the Fed. Uh, it's also government borrowing, but the Fed, because it reduces the perceived cost of government. When government, when the federal government can... Uh, finance its programs by money printing, it doesn't have to tax people. Uh, you know, Mises wrote in, in Human Action, he wrote about how, you know, think of what it would be if the government had to fund its wars through taxes. Uh, even the current wars that the U.S. government is involved in, what if it had to go to each taxpaying family and say, here's your bill for this year for Iraq, $10,000, you think there would be, you think when, when, when these uh, people in camouflage walk through the airports, there'd be as mu quite as much cheering and clapping uh, o over this if, if you had just gotten a bill for ten or $20,000 to pay your share of the war in, uh, you know, wherever, you know, Syria, uh, you know, they've been agitating for war in Syria. Not likely. So the wars would be uh, much shorter and and fewer of them, certainly, if we paid for war with taxes rather than money printing, then the cost becomes invisible. Or borrowing, for that matter. The cost is you know, thought to be put off on the future generations by, by, by most people when it's, uh, if you're borrowing. So it doesn't cost anything. And that's, that's called fiscal illusion. If you think of it in terms of the law of demand, uh, you're moving down along the demand curve. The perceived price of government is lower, you know, it, it, because you don't see it. The real price is there. We use the same resources that uh, the, in reality, but you know, the perception of what you're uh, paying is, is much lower if the government can delay the cost through borrowing or hide it through, uh, through money printing. Uh, okay, the cost comes uh, in terms of uh, malinvestment and boom and bust cycles and price inflation eventually, okay? So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, that, uh, that these are just some of the tactics government uses to destroy wealth in the economy. And it's the inherent nature of political entrepreneurship to be wealth destroying. So that's what, these, are, these are some of the reasons why when you hear Austrians say the growth of government uh, is, is the opposite of Keynesianism. You know, Keynesianism is the growth of government uh, boosts the economy. 
Well, these are some specific examples, I think, of how, no, political entrepreneurship is wealth destroying and almost everything government does is, is an effort, has the effect of destroying wealth creation or at least impeding the progress of wealth creation in one way or another. And uh, so that's about it for now. I guess that's all I have time for. There's some people outside the door tapping their toes. So I guess we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>